All right, well, thanks very much, Phil, um, and thanks everyone for coming to this talk. So this talk will be probably a little bit different uh, than what Rob was talking about, um, mostly because what I'm going to spend quite a bit of time talking about is actually the problem, um, and that's mostly because we don't yet have very good solutions for it, but we do have some very good directions. So to understand the problem, um, I first want to quickly go over what we have at the moment for the technology that underpins all of the computing technologies that we have. Um, and that is the silicon thin fat. So this is the state of the art transistor that exists in all of the current uh, state of the art uh, processes. And it consists of a um, conducting channel, which looks like a fin. And then we have an insulating material covered by a metal gate. And this allows us to change the conductivity of the channel by applying a voltage to the gate. And so if we consider just the, the circuit diagram schematic, um, we have our drain and source and our gate. We can apply a voltage to the channel um, but if the gate is in the off state, then no current flows through the gate, uh, through the channel. And if we then apply a voltage to our gate, we then get current flow. So this allows us to define two different states and we can have um, an on state and an off state, a zero and a one. And so this allows us to have our binary logic. We can combine lots of these together to build uh, big circuits and do all of our computing. Now, if we look at this part of the transistor, our gate, what we see is we have two uh, conductors separated by an insulator and that creates a capacitor with some capacitance C. And if we remember back to our electronics, um, the energy stored on a capacitor is uh, proportional to CV squared. So it's a half CV squared. Um, and we can drop the half because we don't have to worry too much about the actual number that we get out. What we care about is this relationship. And so uh, V here is just the voltage we're operating um, our processor at. And so if we switch this gain many times a second, uh, a few billion actually, uh, so let's say a few gigahertz, then we multiply by the frequency and that gives us a power. And then this is just for one transistor. We talk about now for the entire CPU. If we think about the average number of transistors that are switching every single cycle, then we can work out roughly what the power of our CPU is. And it's important to remember here that the electrical power and um, heat are interchangeable. So all of our electrical power gets converted to heat with almost perfect efficiency. So, um, if we now put some numbers in just quickly, uh, roughly speaking, the capacitance is of the order of about 10 attofarads. Uh, typical voltage is about 1.3, 3.6 gigahertz is a fairly recent processing speed. And then modern transistors, uh, modern CPUs will have around 10 billion transistors. So if we assume that roughly half of them are switching every cycle, um, we can get a, a power out of about 150 watts. And this is including that factor of a half that I dropped. So it's a bit high, but it, it shows that it's quite close to what we have for modern CPU. So the relationship more or less works. And the reason I want to keep this one equation here is because it explains how all of these contribute to the power and to the heat that gets generated um, by our computing technology. So if we look at how this is scaled over the years, um, most of you probably have heard of Moore's law, which dictates how the um, number of transistors scales exponentially over time uh, in an integrated circuit. And so what I did was I picked a, a selection of 23 CPUs over the last 40 years, um, starting in 1982, the year that I was born. Um, and by just collecting the data, I've produced a few graphs that kind of show um, why we actually are approaching um, kind of a limit and why we have to look at new technologies for computing. So. At first glance, it looks like there isn't really a problem because in red, we see the number of transistors over time and we see that it follows uh, an exponential rate as expected. And for the last decade or so, you've probably heard about how Moore's law is slowing down or it's coming to an end. Um, but so far, the data doesn't seem to show that. And there are many graphs that, that show this. Um, what we also see is that the size of the transistors has also been decreasing um, exponentially. Um, so at first glance, it looks like there isn't really a problem. Uh, to really understand it, we have to look at some other data. And what this shows for the same uh, CPUs is the operating voltage. So we're looking at the right-hand axis. And back in the 80s, they were operating at five volts. We saw a dramatic improvement in the 90s. And then it more or less saturated about 20 years ago. And one of the key points here is that the voltage we operate these transistors at does actually have a thermodynamic limit. So it doesn't set the actual voltage we use, um, but what it sets is how much voltage we need to increase the current to our on state. And so this thermodynamic limit was probably reached around about 20 years ago. And since then, we haven't actually been able to improve on that at all. So that more or less sets the voltage at the lowest possible value that we can have. And for me, this is the most um, important indication that for the last 20 years, we've been on borrowed time uh, in terms of making our computing more efficient. And we can see this here where in 
The red data point here shows the power of CPUs over time, and that peaked or uh, well, saturated more or less at the same point. Um, and the consequence of this is that uh, the operating frequency hasn't been able to increase either because that scales with power as well. And so um, once we reached about 100 watts, uh, the temperatures inside the CPU started to get dangerously high. And so nowadays, um, manufacturers have to limit how much power is actually being used by the CPUs to prevent them from be becoming damaged by overheating. And so as you can see, around right about 20 years ago, we already reached our limit. However, the number of transistors has continued to increase. And according to our equation, that should mean the power should have continued going up. And one of the reasons it hasn't, and it's, it's quite a complicated reason why it hasn't, one of the reasons is that we continue to make transistors much, much smaller. And as we do that, that reduces um, the capacitance, which is another term in our equation that increases the power. So we've managed to reduce the capacitance a little bit, which helps to keep the power down. But we've also changed the way um, that we've been using transistors to build processes. So we've gone to multi-core processes, uh, and there's been lots of optimization. And the reality is now, when you're using your processor, you aren't necessarily having access to all of the available capacity that it, that it can. Um, some parts of the processor get turned off when they're not being used to help save power. So that Moore's law scaling is actually quite deceptive right now because we, we're not actually using all the transistors that are available. And that's more or less how we've managed to keep the power down. And so when we think about the, the scaling of making our transistors smaller, if we look at what we have at the moment, um, this is from uh, 2018. This is Apple's A12 chip based on uh, TSMC's seven nanometer process. And if you look at the scale bar down here, this is 20 nanometers, which means that our FinFETs here have a channel width, which is a few nanometers thick. That's tens of silicon atoms wide. And as we keep making this smaller, there is ultimately a fundamental limit, which is a single layer of silicon atoms. Now, I don't know whether we can reach that limit, at least maybe not in silicon. Um, it has been tried in other materials. So these are two dimensional materials. And it's a paper from uh, a group from two years ago. Um, they used molybdenum disulfide, tungsten disulfide, and um, single walled carbon nanotubes to produce uh, thin fat transistors to show that it works. Um, they weren't particularly good. And this is also just at a, a fundamental research stage. This is not ready for any kind of commercialization. But even if it was, where do you go from here? They're already as small as or as thin as we can make them. And so how does the scaling improve to help us get the power down? And one of the reasons we want to get the power down is, you know, for, for consumers, it doesn't really matter. Our, you know, smartphones, laptops, tablets, they run on batteries. They're very, very efficient. They don't consume a lot of power, but often we're using them to connect to the internet. And when we do that, we have um, massive data centers all around the world uh, with millions and millions of servers sending us you know, streaming uh, music uh, over Spotify, films through Netflix. Every time we do a Google search, check our email, go on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, all of that is being done in data centers. So it doesn't seem like it's doing much for us. We use our smartphone, it doesn't get very warm, it doesn't seem to use a lot of power. That's because most of the power involved in that usage is actually somewhere else in a data center. And it's in these data centers where the power consumption is no longer sustainable. And so we need to think about how um, future computing can change to actually reduce that. And at the moment, we can see that we can't make them any smaller and we're already thermodynamically limited in terms of the voltage. So one potential option is actually cryogenics. Uh, the figure on the left here shows um, this fundamental limit. So this is the, the Boltzmann limit for something called the, the sub-threshold swing, which tells you how much voltage you need to increase the current. And First of all, we can see that current technology is already very close to that limit. So they can't get any lower, which is quite impressive that they've got there. But it does also show that it can scale with temperature until about 50 Kelvin. So on the one hand, this is good. It does scale with temperature the way that we expect. Um, it does start to saturate. But as far as I know, um, as far as anyone knows, the saturation here is not a fundamental limit, but a technological one. And humans are very good at solving technological problems. So Possibly in future, uh, if we can solve that problem, we could scale this even further. And it's a gross oversimplification, but um, if reducing the temperature by a factor of 100, reduce the voltage by 100, that, reduce, that would reduce the power by a factor of 10 to the 4, which is a significant reduction, um, even if you take into account the energy cost of making things cold. So one option for future computing could be operating existing technology at low temperatures, However, we can also think about superconducting circuits, so using superconductors to make classical uh, CPUs or processors. 
Uh, and then of course, quantum computing. Now, I don't know that anyone knows exactly what quantum computing will be useful for, um, but it is being invested in quite heavily and cryogenic electronics will be an essential component of that. And so it's, it's worth looking at. So to look at other companies that are in investing in this, so Rambus make um, memory chips for a, a wide range of um, consumer electronics and also for servers and data centers. And they're looking at cryogenic memory uh, to reduce the power consumption of the vast amounts of memory used in data centers to make them more energy efficient. And then when we think about quantum computing, um, on the left here, you see a cryostat that would be used for cooling down some qubits. So the qubits would be at the bottom at the lowest temperature, close to absolute zero. Um, but the electronics that control them would exist outside the cryostat. And that's what all of this wiring is for. So for every qubit you have, you need somewhere between one and four um, wires to control your qubit, depending on the technology. And so if you have 10 qubits, you need tens of wires, hundreds, you need hundreds of wires. And so there is a scaling problem for quantum computers. And the solution to that is to actually build the electronics we need to control them um, at low temperatures. And that means making some kind of low temperature electronics. At the moment, most companies are investing in existing silicon technology. So this is from Google's research. Um, that's a CMOS chip, which has been used to control a single qubit. Um, and so they're using this to develop the control electronics at low temperatures. Now, just a quick aside on wiring. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was at a conference um, for a March meeting. And at the exhibition, there was a, a new company that came out of stealth mode, and they're selling a refrigerator for quantum computing. And what they're actually trying to sell here is not just the computer, but it's actually a wiring solution, which you see on the right. So their wiring solution here is um, hundreds and or even thousands of high density coax lines squeezed into a fridge. And I show this mostly as a demonstration of why this is not a good solution. It's thousands of wires, it takes up all the space, but it also doesn't scale. If you needed a million qubits, you'd need a thousand of these fridges. So it doesn't really work. Uh, Microsoft are also looking at using cryogenic CMOS to control qubits. Um, so is Intel, they have a slightly different qubit technology, but they're doing the same thing. They want to integrate their qubits into existing silicon, which they can then also build all the control electronics on. Uh, and that will then operate at the base temperature between one and four Kelvin. So moving away from quantum computing, uh, we can also use superconducting circuits. So on the right hand side is a superconducting processor. So this is made using uh, superconducting um, devices and it can operate in principle, upwards of 100 gigahertz. So if you need high speed computing, then this is one uh, potential option as well. Um, but because it's superconducting, it has much less power dissipation com compared with existing silicon technology. So this allows you to do classical computations uh, with superconductors. Um, and IBM were actually involved in um, a lot of the developments for this work, uh, probably going back decades now. And they're looking at combining both superconducting and classical silicon technology to control their qubits. And so the point of all of this is to say that for computing, cry cryogenic electronics is a future. It might not be the future, and it probably won't be visible to us um, at home, but it is something that might turn up in all of our data centers. So why am I talking about that? Well, at Lancaster, we do a lot of research in cryogenic electronics, um, not necessarily directly uh, aimed at the topics I've just covered, but um, a lot of this work does link in quite well. So uh, a few years ago, I was a postdoc and I worked on a project, um, which was a collaboration between Lancaster Physics and Oxford, Oxford Instruments. And the point of this was actually developing the platform that you would use if you had some kind of uh, quantum technology that had um, cryogenic electronics and you wanted to deploy it in a commercial environment. So it's about this was more about developing, developing the platform that you would use um, for deploying this. Um, we also, on the, the lines of um, commercialization, uh, we have a project at the moment where we're trying to build a cryogenic voltage amplifier. So this is analog electronics, which still is needed for things like building quantum computers or even any other kind of um, cryogenic electronics. Um, so a voltage amplifier is something we would use for our scientific measurements. Um, and there is a commercial need for these because uh, there aren't many that are out there. Um, and so we're trying to develop one of these. And um, this is supported partly with some funding from the, the faculty of science and technology who, um, after their impact funding, have, have helped us with this. Um, but also when we, when we actually develop this, uh, we're also trying to understand the fundamental behavior of it at cryogenic temperatures. So in the bottom here, this is what you expect at room temperature. This is from the data sheet. Uh, what we measure at low temperature is quite different. And we have these additional features here. Um, we don't know what they are. They're probably quite trivial, but it's important to know that they exist because the simulations we use to develop the electronics assume that we have this typical characteristic 
what we have to do is develop new models that show the actual characteristics so that we can better simulate the devices when we actually try to build circuits with them. Um, going down a bit further from the uh, sort of commercialization side, um, we're also developing transistors using 2D materials. So this is supported by the Royal Academy of Engineering, who've given me a fellowship. Uh, so this is developing uh, graphene FETs that will be used at low temperatures. Um, I have a collaboration with uh, Tyndall in Ireland, who are making some uh, molybdenum disulfide transistors for us, and we're characterizing those. And so we're trying to understand the behavior of these devices at low temperatures and what we need to do to make them uh, more functional. And this work also feeds into the European microcarbon platform, which Lancaster is a part of. It's a European-wide collaboration for doing low temperature science. And then we also use these for actually doing um, hard science. Um, so understanding some of the fundamental things about our universe, what is dark matter, does it exist? Um, understanding some of the cosmological questions. Um, to do this, we can use um, superconducting electronics for things like making detectors that we use for searching for dark matter. Um, so we have a broad range of cryogenic electronics research at Lancaster um, and cryogenic, cryogenic electronics itself um, is more than just about computing. It can also be used, for example, in space where things are much colder and you don't have to heat up your electronics to make them work. They could be much more efficient at low temperatures uh, in that environment. OK, so I think I haven't run over too much. So uh, thanks, for, thanks, everyone, for listening and happy to answer any questions.